Hey, East Coast. I'm Brian. I'm excited about this weekend. I'm excited that for years here at East Coast, we have said we are building a life-giving church that lasts. We believe in the next generation. We believe that they not only would get poured into, that they would get built up, that they would grow here, but they would thrive here in the local church and beyond. This weekend at all of our locations, in all of our services, we have a different communicator sharing. We have Josh Ellis, we have Whitney Branham, we have Carlia Alderman, we have Allison Goolsby, we have Kyle Barnett, and we have Isaac Everts communicating and bringing the Word of God to you. And we're excited about what they have to share. These are folks who have poured into the lives of the next generation here in our youth ministry for years. Some of them have actually grown up their entire lives here at East Coast Christian Center. And we get to hear from their heart and from God's heart for us today. Come on, would you put your hands together and welcome our speaker today? Come on, let's do this together. Good morning, good morning. If I could actually have everybody stand for a moment, I want to just get some extra reverence and honor to God as we pray together this morning, if you'd pray with me. Thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, God, that your promises are yes and amen, Lord. I thank you, Father, for just speaking to us this morning, speaking directly to our hearts, God. And if I could just pray Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 over us this morning, God, I, I pray that we would trust in you with all our hearts, God, that we would not lean on our own understanding and that we would seek your will, God, in all that we do, God, and that you will show us which paths to take, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Um, so as you may have heard from the video, my name is Carlia Alderman. If you don't know me yet, you may know me as Pastor Keith's wife, who was that handsome fella who was up here a little bit earlier. Um, I serve alongside him in the youth ministry here, which is over our middle and high schoolers. And we have three beautiful kids together. I'm a little bit biased, I know, but they're um, five, seven, and nine. Um, and I have the honor, too, of serving on our worship team here, which is my absolute pride and joy. And I'm just so thankful and so honored to get to speak with you guys this morning. So thank you to pastors Matt and Jessica. Jessica, thank you so much to all the leaders in this church who would believe in this next generation, who truly does believe in building that life-giving church that lasts. So thank you. I'm honored and I am so psyched. You guys are crazy this morning. You guys are the honorary 7.30 a.m. service. So I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm not going to hold back. You guys are with me, right? Yes. All right, so if you've been around here for a couple weeks at least, you may know that we're in the middle of our Seek and Find sermon series. And I think the order of that sermon title is so important because we seek first and then we find, right? It's not very often that we find something, at least something very worthwhile, that we didn't first have to search for. And this sermon series has really caused me to ponder what is it that our world is really seeking right now? What is our world searching for? And I immediately think of things like hope, acceptance, connection, validation, approval, even simpler things on a, a more basic level like answers, information, help, right? It, it's no surprise that Google is the most visited website in the world. They, they actually process over eight and a half billion searches every single day. Okay, just for a little more context, that's 99,000 searches every single second. Every second. And how do I know this? Well, I search Google, of course. I ask them. <laughs> Internet searching has become an everyday part of our society. It's our go-to friend when we need answers and we need them now, right? Many of us use Google, me, multiple times a day. Everything from, you know, what time is this restaurant open till again? Uh, how do we actually spell that word? How do I fix this? Or what, what do these symptoms mean, right? But sometimes I'm even searching for things on Google I don't even need the answers to, right? I, it would just drive me crazy if, if I was one click away from having an answer to something that I don't know and I didn't take it. So I'm going to search anyway. <laughs> but what is it that we actually need to be searching for? searching for, and why is any of this even relevant to church or our walk with God? Well, because what you seek, you find. And if we find what we're searching for, then what we're searching for is very important. My family was recently on the hunt for a new vehicle, or well, when I say new, I mean a new to us vehicle. And let me tell you, the used car market right now is absolutely crazy. It is almost like the housing market where there's not much available, and whatever they do have is either gone like this or it's marked incredibly high. 
Well, I'm, I'm thankful my dad actually helped me with the process and he helped me with negotiating and, and talking to sellers and all that stuff. But we were on the prowl for weeks and this was not any like leisurely shopping, okay? It felt like I was searching every spare minute that I had. I was checking site after site, result after result, hoping and looking that something new would come up, checking doors only to have them slammed in my face. And you know, I'm happy to report that we found an incredible vehicle and God blessed our socks off. But my point is that when you are searching for something, really searching with your whole heart, it becomes like an obsession and you won't stop until you have found it. So my question for you this morning is what are you searching for? And I get it, that's a really broad question, right? Like what do you mean what am I searching for? My next, my next paycheck maybe? Uh, my next meal, that sounds really good. Like I'm just trying to, to make it through the day. I'm trying to keep my kids alive, keep my job, maybe keep my sanity. But we're all searching for something whether we realize it or not. And it isn't always some big, dramatic quest. And if you need help discovering what you might actually already be searching for, whoo, there's a lot of smoke and fog up here. Does anybody see this haze? I'm like, so <laughs> I'm like, why do I feel like I need to cough? Okay. But if you need help discovering what it is you might already be searching for, it might even be as simple as what are you spending your free time doing? Or what are you spending your free time thinking about? And some of us are just searching for rest, right? Like, I I just need a moment to shut my brain off. Or some of us are searching for success. I gotta spend every waking moment making this business profitable. Or some of us are just searching for connection, right? I just gotta have my friends, I gotta have my people by me so I can keep going. Well, what are you searching for? Is that thing worth your attention? And if so, what are you doing to actively find it? You have got to know these answers because they will determine the path of your entire life. And if you don't know what you're searching for, you better find out because God's not the only one pursuing you. It says in 1 Peter 5.8, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But here's the good news. We serve a God who is willing and able to find us even when we're not searching for him, right? A father who intentionally seeks out the lost. A shepherd who will leave the 99 to find the one. A savior who would die for us long before we ever even knew that we needed him too. This is the same God who pursues you, his child, and he will stop at nothing to prove that to you. God sees you. But not only does he see you, he seeks you actively, consistently, and persistently. And we're then able to seek God because he sought us first. Jesus said in Luke 19.10 in the story of Zacchaeus' redemption that we actually read together a few weeks ago, he said, for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. From the creation of the world, God sought us. He made us in his image. And what's the first thing that God spoke to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after they had hidden from him, after they had sinned? God asked them, where are you? Not because he lost them or he didn't know where they were, right? It was because they hid from him. There's that fog, okay. Well, ever since that moment in the Garden of Eden, God has been in a battle for our presence. He is in a pursuit of our pursuit for our attention. And I'm so thankful that he is such a patient father because he will pursue you and wait for you patiently every day until you pursue him back. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is taking note of who seeks him, of who is fully committed, who is willing not who's perfect, not who's best, not by your qualifications or your past, but who is seeking him. The kind of person who, like David, becomes a man or a woman after God's own heart. And those are the hearts, it says, that he is strengthening. Those are the people to whom he says, take up your mat and follow me. The ones who not only see him, but seek him. The ones who not only know of him, but know him him. That's who God uses to change the world. So what are you searching for? Seek first the kingdom of God. 
Seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Seek God first. Ask God first and he will give you everything that you need. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. God is not hiding. He, he doesn't make it hard for us to find him. He is right here. He's right here. He can be right here. And he's right here. The common denominator is actually you and your willingness to meet him. Are you willing? <laughs> we need to be searching for his wisdom and truth every day. If we recognize just how badly that we actually need his wisdom, we would be begging on our hands and knees every day for it. The whole book of Proverbs is really about becoming wise, seeking after wisdom, right? Well, one of my favorite tips that I ever got about reading the book of Proverbs was from Pastor Dan, actually. I heard him say recently on Morning Breath that as you're reading through the book of Proverbs, go ahead and try replacing the word wisdom with the name Jesus. And it'll often bring you an even deeper revelation of the scriptures. Well, it says again and again in the book of Proverbs that nothing you desire can compare with wisdom. It's more valuable than silver, gold, rubies, how we need to be eagerly seeking it, not just waiting for it to show up. And how when we find wisdom, we find joy. It says in Proverbs, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. Those who search will surely find me. To acquire wisdom is to love yourself. To love yourself. People who cherish understanding will prosper, it says. Well, we need to be intentionally pursuing wisdom. God himself. But what does that mean? What does it mean to seek God? Because it's, it's one thing to want to or to recognize that you should, but it's another thing entirely to actually do it, isn't it? Well, there are so many examples of faith-filled people in this word, in this Bible, who sought hard after Jesus and saw their lives radically changed because of it. I think of the woman with the issue of blood who stepped out from her pain and out from the rules of her culture just to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and be healed. I think of the blind beggar in Luke 18 who cried out for Jesus' attention. And when the crowd told him to be quiet, he only shouted louder until Jesus heard him and healed him. I think of the men who broke through a roof to lower down the paralyzed man at the feet of Jesus and be healed. These people knew that Jesus had what they needed and they would stop at nothing to find him. But you know what else all those three stories had in common? A crowd. A crowd, big ones. How many other people were in the crowd those days who saw Jesus but didn't seek Jesus? They knew of him, but they didn't know him. Well, the difference between looking and seeking is time and effort, and a lot of times faith. It's the difference between a casual glance and an intentional pursuit. Don't be a spectator Christian. Do not be a spectator Christian. We are not called to be spectators. We are called to be saints, disciples, children of God, heirs of the kingdom, the temple of God himself, the hands and feet of Jesus, soldiers of Christ, priests and priestesses, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> First Peter 2.9 says that we are not like the rest of the world who stumble because they don't obey God's word. We are a chosen people royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We can't walk into relationship with Christ and remain the same. We can't walk out of church every week and remain the same. When we do, we're treating the God of the universe like we would one of our friends on social media. Yeah, I accepted his friend request, we're friends. 
He comes up in my feet every once in a while. Yeah, what a great guy. So uplifting. I just, I just love following him. That person doesn't know you. And you don't really know him either because you're only getting the highlight reel. And the entire relationship is mass produced, not personal. That is the crowd of God, not the child of God, not the called of God. That relationship I just described is not even friendship. That's a fan, an onlooker. That's not even close to what true following means, is it? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Truly following Jesus is going to require you to lay down some things in order to pick up time with him. It might be your busy schedule. It might be that sin you're still holding on to. It might be your pride. Knowing that God is real is awesome. Man, that is awesome. But God wants more than acknowledgement of existence. James says in 2.19, oh, sorry, James 2.19 says, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Believing in Jesus isn't what makes you a Christian. Following him, seeking him is. And that's just entry-level Christianity, right? After that comes all the good works and the fruit of that faith. But the world as a whole has its priorities entirely backwards. We think that we're actually here for ourselves, right? Our own purposes, our own plans. And we try to give God whatever leftover time we have in our day, if any at all. We accomplish what we need to first, our jobs, our chores, our school, our desires, without stopping to realize while all those things are good and well, they're worthless if they didn't all point to Jesus. God deserves our firsts, not our lasts. And when we give God first priority in our day, it's amazing just how well the rest of the day is going to go and just how much you're going to be able to accomplish it's like going to the gym, right? You wake up in the morning, on a morning probably like this one, and you're like, ah, oh, I don't want to go to the gym. No, don't make me do it. But you know that once you go, you're going to feel amazing, and you're going to feel like you can take on the world, and you're going to accomplish probably twice as much that day. Well, that's what it's like when you give God first priority in your day. We can't grow stagnant in our pursuit. Does anyone here ever drive a Tesla or maybe test-driven or... I certainly have not. But let me tell you, there's something about seeing all these Teslas around the Space Coast. It's like the little child in me that just gets a little bit excited anytime I see one. I'm like, ooh, it is a car that drives itself, okay? There's just something so cool about that ability. But you know what? Autopilot Christianity doesn't work. Autopilot Christianity does not work. It might get you to your final destination. It might, if your only goal is to get to heaven. But the winds and the oncoming traffic may take you down first. And you're certainly not picking up any passengers along the way. It, if we make time for anything in our day, it has to be Jesus. This book is our manual. It is our weapon. The words in these pages are alive and they are speaking directly to whatever situation you're facing right now. We need to be consuming it like our lives depend on it. Like the lives of everyone we know and love depends on it because it does. The difference between looking and seeking is time and effort. Relationships take time. But not just any time. It's not about time passing, but time together. I've known people with a better understanding of who Jesus is after only two weeks than some who followed him for 20 years. There's more available to you than you even realize. Stop accepting the cardboard cutout version of Jesus when the real thing is so much better. We need time in two-way conversation with him. We need time in the word this means time in prayer, time in worship. And I don't just mean on a Sunday morning either. 
Our time together as a church body is absolutely vital. I do not mean to diminish that in the slightest. It's absolutely crucial to our walk with God that we are surrounded by other believers like we are here, that we are having pastors who lead us so we can imitate them as they imitate Christ. But this is just the starting point. This morning, this place, this is the starting line of your race that is the rest of the week. I mean, could you imagine walking away from the message this morning, having heard me speak for maybe 25 minutes or so and thinking, based on that alone, wow, I really know her. Man, we're like this now. Of course not. That's ridiculous. So we can't expect to receive the fullness of our relationship with the God of the universe based on some occasional meetings either. Now you may say, awesome, I'm already doing really good at this, okay? I'm reading my Bible every day. I pray without ceasing. I only listen to worship music. I consult God about everything that I do. Great, that is awesome. Take a step deeper. We all have another step deeper that we can go in our relationship with Jesus. He may have already even told you what that next step is. You just need to be obedient to do it. It may be serving somewhere in the church. This isn't a spectator sport, remember? It may be attending a small group or a freedom group, or better yet, leading or starting one of those groups. It may be giving or tithing for the first time, opening up your hands to the lost and the hurting in new ways, praying for somebody who's hurting. It's being willing to go outside of our comfort zones. Let's get our hands dirty, y'all. Let's have real faith that doesn't only live within the walls of this building. Let's step outside of those clean boxes of our own expectations and be willing to see where God wants to take us. One of my absolute favorite proverbs, which I usually apply to my children because they are little mini tornadoes, let's just say, (laughs) is Proverbs 14.4. And it says, without oxen, a stable stays clean. Whoo, I can relate to that. Without oxen, a stable stays clean. But you need a strong ox for a large harvest. Some of us are afraid to let God into our stable because we like the way it looks right now. Ooh, it's so tidy. I just decorated it just how I want it to be. This couch is so nice and comfortable. Oh, this picture right here, it's covering up that one hole I'm too afraid to expose. This rug, it's placed just right so that I I don't have to stop blaming the other people for the stains underneath instead of choosing to forgive them and clean up my own mess. I say this not to condemn you, okay? I know I'm stepping on toes. I'm stepping on my own toes too. (laughs) And that's why I say it. I say this to convict you, not to condemn you. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Our stables may look clean, but they're empty. And we need that strong, messy ox, in this case, Jesus, working for us in order to take up our full harvest, that abundance of crops, the blessings, the provision. So don't fear the mess or what it might mean to follow Jesus. You need to anticipate that abundance. Take your next steps toward him with excitement because when you draw near to him, he's going to draw nearer to you. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Get close and he gets closer. And we know from multiple scriptures that the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That scripture goes on to say that those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And soon you won't just be wanting him inside your stable. Oh, no, you'll be like, God, come take over the whole house, please. Better yet, I am coming. I'm moving into your house, Lord. Because the ones who take up their cross, leave their old life behind, and follow Jesus are the ones who finally know true joy and purpose, true love and freedom. In Luke 11, Jesus says, and so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. The door is wide open to you. 
And not just any old door, okay, but the floodgates of heaven. It is wide open and available to you. You know, I just got to tell you real quick, I did not plan on saying this this morning, but I got a firsthand experience of these verses right here. Just a few days ago, on, on Friday morning, I took my daughter to the orthodontist for the very first time. She's never been to this place. She's never met the dentist there before. But as soon as she walks in, she's like, Mom, do you think they have a treasure chest here? And I'm, like, I'm looking around the place, and I'm like, it's really not that kind of place, baby. This is not a kid's dentist office. I don't think they're going to have anything like that. But don't worry. I'll take care of you, okay? Um, you know, if we get done and they don't have anything, I'll get you some candy. It'll be better than whatever 20-cent toy they're going to be able to give you, okay? Well, by the end of the appointment, the doctor, the dentist, turns to her and says, do you have any questions for me? What do you think she had to ask him? What do you think? Much to my immediate embarrassment, she's asking him, do you have a treasure chest here? And my mind immediately goes to like, oh gosh, I need to show him that I don't expect anything from him, that it's okay, that like I'm trying to make excuses for her, that she's not selfish. But you know what he says immediately? He says, oh, sweetheart, let me see what I can do for you. He leaves the room and he comes back with a $15 Visa gift card for her, okay? Okay, a $15 Visa gift card. And I'm just like, wow. When you ask, you receive. I should have never stunted what you wanted to ask, girl. You ask it. You ask away, guys, okay? And how much better is our God, our Father, than some, some orthodontist somewhere, okay? That was awesome. But God is so much greater. So that door is wide open to you wide open and available, those floodgates of heaven. But be sure that when the door is opened, that you walk through it. You don't just take a peek inside. Taste and see that the Lord is good and then get your butt inside. Luke 13, 24 through 27, Jesus says, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and we drank with you and you taught in our streets. And the Lord will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. Don't get to the end of your life or to the end of today, for that matter, with God being able to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servants. The door is open now. Knock now. Seek now. It is an open invitation. But don't miss the party. There are some of you in this place this morning, I believe, who may still need to take that first step with Jesus that first step in following him that says, I might not know what, what this means exactly. I might not know exactly what my life is about to look like, but I do know that I need something more. I do know that I want to taste and see if the Lord really is good and I wanna stop doing things my way and try them his way instead. And if that's you, we're about to say a prayer together. All of us, we do things as a family here. And whether you've known God for five minutes or your whole life, we're going to pray all these words together because you're not alone. But I want to do this a little bit differently this morning. If everybody could actually rise to your feet again, we're going to have another moment of reverence with God. And once you're standing, you can then close your eyes and bow your heads. And I want you all to picture God. I want you all to picture Jesus See him in your mind. He's walking toward you, and you're walking toward him. And now we're just going to have a conversation with him. As you'll repeat after me, say, Lord, I believe in you, in the Father, and the Son, and your Holy Spirit. I know I've sinned. I know I've fallen short. And I've taken my own path. But you lived for me and you died for me, and you rose from the dead so we could know each other. 
Thank you. Today I turn from my own ways and I choose to follow you. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to seek you above all else. Lord, I am knocking at your door and I long to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer just now for the first time, I'm gonna ask you to take another first step in Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to be bold in just a moment and raise your hand when I tell you. This is just a moment of faith and stepping out and saying, I did it and I'm following him now. My life is different. And when you do, you're not gonna be met with eyes of judgment, but you'll be met with cheers of acceptance. So on the count of three, if that was you, go ahead and raise your hand. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That is the most incredible decision that you could ever make. And just as we applauded, all of heaven is cheering right now with every soul that turns to him. So remember, what you seek, you will find. So seek first the kingdom of God, not as a crowd, but as the called child. Pastor Keith, would you take over? Amen.